Welcome to Oxford News This Week. I'm Elgin Nichols. And I'm Terry Stiles. In this week's news, Oxford Hills owner passes away at 71, requests made to change the lake's offensive name, and a crash leaves a pedestrian dead. Stay tuned. Learn more about these stories and others. The Oxford News begins right now. A 63-year-old Oxford Township man died October 29th after being struck by a vehicle driven by a 21-year-old Metamora man. The Oakland County Sheriff's Office said while it was early morning and still dark, the victim had a light and was walking his dog when he crossed Drainer in a non-crosswalk location. Investigators said that he was hit uh, near the double yellow line in the center of the road. The driver did stop called 911 and remained on the scene until EMS arrived. The dog was later located unharmed and returned to the family. Neither alcohol nor drugs was believed to be the factor. Oxford voters will see a familiar name on the August 2020 election primary ballot. This time it will be under the category of township supervisor. Oxford Township resident Jack Curtis, who has lived in the community for 45 years, recently announced his candidacy. He said he fills his years of service in government roles at both the township and vi village levels make him qualified for the job. Addison Township's efforts to build a new public library received a significant funding boost this month. Four County Community Foundation, a nonprofit organization based in Elmont, pledged to give $100,000 if certain conditions are met. Executive Director of the Foundation, Kathy Dickens, said the decision to pledge the funds was based on Addison Township Library's good reputation, strong contributions to the community, effective outreach efforts, and a need for space. Library officials are working toward constructing a new facility on a site along Rochester Road. And to learn more about this project, visit www.letsbuildalibrary. A $100,000 grant has been gifted to Crossroads for Youth by Impact 100 of Oakland County. The money will be used to let adolescents work with shelter dogs before the dogs are adopted out. For the past decade, Crossroads has partnered with Teachers Pet, a nonprofit with the mission to provide troubled youth with dogs to bond with and take care of. Teachers Pet partners five dogs from Oakland County Animal Control with students who will work together to train both the student and pet over the course of the program. Clinical Director for Crossroads for Youth, Chris Vale, says over the past ten, over 10 weeks, the students get an hour of classroom time and an hour of hands-on time with their dog. What a great program. A complaint to the federal government about an apparent and sensitive name of an Oxford Township lake could potentially lead to a change. According to documents from the U.S. Board of Geographic Names, a person named Christina West was proposed changing the name of Squaw Lake to Point Lake. West proposed Point Lake because the body of water is shaped like an arrow point, with Clear Lake as the bottom of the arrow. Township board member Jack Curtis will request the issue be placed on the November board meeting agenda. A religious community which has been part of Oxford for 71 years is preparing to leave and sell its property. It is not determined when, but the Dominican Sisters Mother House will be closing its doors and the remaining 10 sisters will be moving to another convent. Director of Communications for the Dominican Sisters, Alice Black, said the sisters will continue to maintain a presence in the area through the Lord's Senior Community and a convent in Waterford. We wish them luck. Addison Township firefighters battled a Hosner Roadhouse fire, which is part of the Kingsbury Co uh, Country Day School property. An electric space heater is the suspected cause, according to Fire Chief Jerry Morawski. 
The fire moved from the laundry room into an adjoining hallway and the kitchen, but was stopped by firefighters before it could spread to the rest of the house. Addison was assisted at the scene by Oxford, Metamore, and Oakland Township firefighters. Kingsbury head of school, David Poyer, lives in the home with his wife and three children. No one was home when the fire started and Poyer discovered it when he returned home. 71-year-old Bob Hubbard of Oxford Hills Golf Club passed away last month. Hubbard was the second generation of his family to own and operate the public golf course after his father, John Hubbard, passed away in, 20, in 2006. The course was designed and built by his father in the 1960s, and by 1970, it was an 18-hole golf course, and it was complete. To learn more about Hubbard and his life, please see his obituary at the Oxford Leader. The weekend before Halloween, the Oxford Township Parks and Recreation Department held its annual Jack-O-Lantern Jamboree in Oakwood Lake Park, which turned out to be a good success with over 90 tickets that were sold. Kids went trick-or-treating, enjoying apple cider and donuts, donut holes, then picked a pumpkin from the patch. If you would like to see how it went uh, and, and watch our community access this week to get a peek. Hmm. That was cute. I got to edit that together, and they, uh, that was cute. There were quite a few people out there. I was surprised. It was kind of a chilly day, and mm -hmm. good for Parks and Recs. It's there, been right? a chilly day. <laughs> oh, boy, I'll tell you. Several ya. chilly days. So we just passed Halloween, <laughs> and it got really chilly that night. <laughs> yes, it did. And from what I understand, quite a few people were without power the day yes. after Halloween. Well, we're very fortunate. Yep. We're in our subdivision, all the <laughs> power is underground. So we don't have any oh, issues. Oh, you have actually. one of those newer subdivisions. Yeah, well, yeah. kind of, yeah. I live out in Ortonville, and usually if you go, the power goes out. <laughs> so. I see one of those. Hey, I want to ask you about the change of the uh, name of the lake. What do you yeah. think of that? Oh, I'm not happy about that at all. Hmm. Number one, I have some Native American blood in me. Yes, you do. And we're wiping out the Native Americans. You can't say the Chiefs anymore. You can't say the Chippewas anymore. You, Squaw Lake. What is wrong with that? That's what the Native Americans mm -hmm. called their women. That doesn't, it's not derogatory. I'm not offended by it, and I have Native American blood. I went to funerals when I was younger, and I thought I was on a reservation. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't, I, I'm not, I, I have never been offended by that name. And if you're going to change the name of it, why call it Point? Yeah. When, if it looks like an arrow, call it Arrow Lake. Yeah. But it, leave it alone. I, that's ridiculous. I'm so tired of being woke and politically correct. Right. We're, our history is disappearing. It's crazy. It's, I mean, they're uh, destroying uh, statues. I mean, uh, uh, it's all history. I mean, it, is, it was what it, it was, and it is what it is. That's right. That, so. and, and how are we going to learn from our history if we get rid of it? You're going to rewrite history, and that's not the way history is done. I don't believe that's not what I was told. It never anyway has been until now. No. I don't know what's going on. Uh, it's crazy. I'm not offended by that. And I've been an Oxford resident and lived in, and worked in Oxford my entire adult life. I'm not offended by it. So, Miss West, maybe you would want to do a little poll and see if people are offended, or Jack Curtis. I know Jack's going to put it on the agenda. Um, I don't want to be at that meeting and get all upset, but I just can't even understand hmm. you wonder that, if, being offended by that. You wonder, really, if she has any um, Native uh, ancestry at all in her family. Um, I if doubt she it. did, I can't understand why she would be offended by that, because um, that's what the Native Americans mm -hmm. called their women. It's like us calling Mrs. or mm -hmm. us saying, my mother was a woman or my mm -hmm. mother was a mother. It's part of their language. So she's saying, let's wipe out the language of the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Wait, who was here first? Right. Are the Native <sighs> uh, Americans, are they uh, complaining about this? Probably not. I'm not. Uh, and I have one thing I'm to say about I'm complaining that it's going to be changed. Right. Native uh, Americans, uh, seem to have their act together out there, so I don't know why they they'd want to change things like that. They know how not to offend one another. I yeah. mean, that was their entire purpose in life. Right. And 
At any rate, there's my opinion again. You got my opinion. And that's it for Oxford News this week. If you'd like to learn more about these stories and others, you can pick up a copy of the Oxford Leader newspaper. And let me say congratulations, CJ, on opening up a new portion of his life. You're mm -hmm. going to be missed. But you can catch us on our website at occtv.org, on YouTube, and of course our regular channels, Spectrum, Channel 191, and AT&T Channel 99. And coming up soon, OCTV's very own Cody Wright with School Sports and School News incorporating great topics with Alexis Ware and River Tuck. And you won't want to miss Auto Talk and Science in the News with Dave Kenny. I'm Terry Stiles. Thanks for watching Oxford News This Week, where we bring your news closer to home. And I'm Elgin Nichols. Remember, always be kind to your friends and neighbors, and thanks for watching. Welcome to Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication New Scientist. In our first story, up to 630 million people are living on land threatened by flooding from sea level rises by the end of the century, three times as many as previously thought, according to a new analysis. The greatest increase in the risk <clears throat> was found for communities living in Asian megacities due to the way earlier estimates were worked out. To us, it's a staggering difference. It's a completely new perspective on the scale of this threat, says Benjamin Strauss at Climate Central, a New Jersey-based independent organization. Previous calculations of the number of people at risk have been based on estimates of land elevation around the world using satellite data from NASA. But that approach gets confused by rooftops and forests, which can be mistaken for the ground, meaning a skyscraper-packed city such as Shanghai could look at a misleadingly low risk of flooding as seas rise. Strauss and his colleague Scott Kopp have used artificial intelligence to train a model on several sets of data, including much more accurate maps of the elevation in the U.S. captured by planes using laser light. The model predicted where the old data was making mistakes and tried to flatten the errors caused by buildings and trees to reassess the vulnerability of cities. The results suggest that there are far more people living on land below annual flood levels now at 250 million people versus estimates of the old data of up to 65 million. As global warming causes sea levels to rise, that quarter of a billion jumps to as many as 630 million by 2100, assuming a future in which greenhouse gas emission rises are high. The biggest relative increases by the end of the century are in Asia, with 87 million people in China on at-risk land versus 26 million in previous estimates, and in Bangladesh, the number is 50 million, up from 5 million. The old approach may have been heavily mis underestimating risk in the region because of the dense tall cities around Asia's coastlines. Culp says there are two big caveats. They did not consider sea defenses and future populations. Nevertheless, Strauss says the finding should act as an early warning call for governments and city leaders. In our next story, a genetic mutation that allows people to feel fully rested with fewer than six hours sleep a night has been identified by studying a family who gets by on less than average sleep. It is the second such finding in recent months. Ying Hu Fu uh, the, at the University of California in San Francisco and her colleagues have been seeking out and studying families in which some people seem to need less sleep than normal. They have been looking for the gene variants that might be responsible and genetically engineering these variants into mice to confirm their effect. Her team has found several mutations make people need less sleep. In August, Fu's team reported that a mutation in a gene called ADRB1 allows 12 members of a family to sleep as little as 4.5 hours per night without feeling tired. This gene codes for a receptor protein common in a brain region called the dorsal pons, known to regulate sleep. Now the team has found a mutation in a gene called NPSR1 in another family in which some people report feeling fully rested after much less sleep than average. Of the two members of this family whose sleep habits they studied, one averaged 5.5 hours a night and the other just 4.3 hours. NPSR1 codes for a protein receptor in the brain known to be involved in the arousal and sleep behavior. When the team engineered the mutation into mice, they slept less without any obvious effect on health or memory. Another variation in NPSR1 has previously been linked to people requiring 20 minutes less sleep than average based on studies of tens of thousands of people. On average, 
People need eight hours of sleep a night. In most people, sleeping less than six hours a night results in a marked decline in cognitive behavior within days. Over long periods, sleep deprivation can contribute to many disorders, including obesity, heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and depression. As far as, F F as Fuse team has been able to tell, however, people who sleep less because they have one of these gene variants are healthy and don't appear to suffer any ill effects. However, to be absolutely sure would require long-term studies involving a large number of people, which isn't feasible, unfortunately. Well, that's it for this edition of Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television. Welcome back. Last week was two really big events for OHS. The dance team had their conservatory performance, and Friday was the yearly Americana concert. This week, we kick off the first full week of November with superintendent office hours. Tuesday, November 5th, all elementary schools have no school for the day, and Wednesday, 8th graders pack their bags to head to Washington, D.C. for the remainder of the week. High school parents, teachers, and family members are getting ready for the OHS TED Talk in the Performing Arts Center. If interested in attending this event, doors open at 6. Not too many more events going on around town, but Superintendent Tim Throne sure has a lot of updates from board offices. Take a listen to his recent podcast. We have uh, two local celebrities, I'll say it that way, this morning. Uh, the first one is Jim Sharp, and the second one is Pete Schultz. And so, uh, Jim, why don't you just jump in and uh, give us a little introductory statement about yourself. All right. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, as uh, he said, my name is Jim Sharp. I'm the president of Sharp Engineering. We're a civil engineering firm specializing in municipal and private development infrastructure design. I uh, established the company back in 2009. Our offices are located here in uh, in Oxford at 101 North Washington. We do water main designs, road designs, sewer designs, um, basically things that are needed, you know, for uh, for people to be able to get around the community, to be able to service, drink your water, and flush your toilets. <laughs> And Jim, you've uh, you've been in the community a while. In fact, you've had uh, at least a couple of kids come through Oxford schools. I have. I've lived in the community with my wife for 25 years. Awesome. Yep. We've had uh, three boys come through the Oxford community school system here. Stay tuned for more of his podcast. Visit Oxford Community School on SoundCloud. Also stay tuned to the Schooling Around segment to keep updated on all of the events going around around the school district. Hope you all can get out and enjoy some of this fall pre-winter weather. But until next time, I'm Alexis Ware. What's going on, Wildcat fans? Cody right back here with this week's sports report. It's been a great fall sports season, but it's just about time to say goodbye. Not a whole lot to look at this week, but let's take a quick look. First off, the boys football team season came to an end at Oak Park in their last game of the season, falling 35 to seven. Uh, the boys record was one and five in league play and one and eight overall. Uh, it is no question that the boys had a very tough run this year. And like I've said before, that's just something all high school sports programs go through uh, from time to time. Uh, we had a much younger team than last year and we graduated some very key players that attributed to our success in 2018. Uh, the good news is though, it's all behind us and now we have a full off season to grow, to mature, um, and to rebuild. You watch this team will be successful as these young players find their feet, confidence, and and start to compete in this tough division. Um, we have a very experienced coach behind us, so we will be sure to have some success in our future once again. Uh, we look forward to next year. On the flip side, the girls volleyball team ended their regular season with a win against the Groves Falcons. Uh, the girls finished their season two and five in division play, tied with Detroit Colts for sixth place. Uh, the undefeated Clarkson Wolves, seven and zero, took first place in the OAA Red Division. Uh, it's not over yet for the girls to keep the season alive. They will now take on Waterford Kettering in their district opener at Lake Orion High School on November 6th. That is starting at 5.30 p.m. Uh, so make a quick trip to our neighbors and rivals in green and show your support to keep our volleyball season alive. And last but not least, the boys tennis team wrapped up their season in district play at Clarkson High School. Uh, even though the season is over, there is still some 
uh, some things to graduate on. Senior Hayden Durant was named All-League number one singles. Uh, senior Cam Numbru was named All-League in the number four flight. Uh, Chase Mayer and Gabe Smith were voted as the league's best at number two doubles. And Dan and Silas Van Almen both received honorable mention. Uh, this is certainly something to be proud of and it speaks for the depth of our team uh, that we had with us this season. Uh, like I said, it's just about over for our fall sports. Soon we will be diving into winter action with basketball, wrestling, hockey, swim, and more. Uh, not much time for a breather. We still have a full season or a full two seasons uh, ahead of us for Oxford sports. For any more info on these events and more, go to OxfordAthletics.org. Uh, there's plenty of game breakdown, statistics, and more all right there for you to check out. Once again, that is OxfordAthletics.org. Uh, while you're at it, might as well check us out at OCCTV.org. All of our coverage of these events and more can be found on our YouTube page, which you can access through the website. Uh, once again, that is OCCTV.org. I want to thank you all for watching and remind you all to tune in next time. But until then, I'm Cody Wright. Go Wildcats! Welcome to this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication Automotive News. In our first story, Fiat Chrysler Automotive and PSA Group plan to join forces through a 50-50 share swap to create the world's fourth largest automaker, they said on October 31st, triggering a new wave of consolidation in the car industry. FCA and PSA said they aim to reach a binding deal to create a $50 billion company headquartered in the Netherlands with listings in Paris, Milan, and New York, and with PSA's Carlos Tavares as CEO and FCA's John Elkman as chairman. The supervisory board of uh, Peugeot and the board of directors of Fiat Chrysler Automobiles have each unanimously agreed to work toward a full combination of their respective businesses by way of a 50-50 merger, the company said in a joint statement. The management teams of FCA and PSA will seek to finalize the discussions in the coming weeks to create a group with 8.7 million in annual vehicle sales and make saving of 4.1 billion even without plant closures, they said. The group will include the Fiat, Dodge, Ram, Chrysler, Alfa Romeo, Maserati, Peugeot, DS, Opel, and Vauxhall brands, allowing it to serve mass and premium passenger car markets as well as trucks and light commercial vehicles. About 80% of potential synergies could be achieved with four years, within four years, that is, at a cost of $3.1 billion, the company said. The combined group will have an 11-person board with six members coming from PSA and five from FCA. As part of the deal, FCA will pay its shareholders a $6.1 billion special dividend and hand them shares in its robot-making unit, Kamau, they said. Stricter UE, EU, that is, anti-pollution rules that have taken full effect in 2021 have triggered heavy investments into electrical and hybrid vehicles as European lawmakers forced a 37.5% cut in CO2 emissions between 2021 and 2030 after a 40% emissions cut between 2007 and 2021. A combination with PSA would get FCA access to the French group's more modern and more flexible vehicle technologies, including the CMP modular platform, which was launched in 2019 for Peugeot E208 subcompact and donated the technology which allowed Opel to build a sibling model, the Corsa E. Meanwhile, the deal would give PSA a stronger position in North America where FCA makes the vast bulk of its profits. PSA has already integrated Opel and Vauxhall, which it bought from General Motors in 2017, shifting them from nine GM platforms to just two, a step which helped Opel to return to profit after more than a decade of losses. And on the recall front, General Motors is recalling 638,000 SUVs and pickup trucks because a wheel speed sensor could fail and cause unintended braking, it said October 31st. The recall covers 2015 to 2020 Chevrolet Suburban Tahoe and Yukon, and 2014 to 2018 Chevrolet Silverado 1500 and GMC Sierra 1500 vehicles equipped with a 5.3 liter engine, a 3.08 ratio rear axle, and four-wheel drive. The sensor failure could result in unintended activation of the driveline protection system and cause unintended braking of the wheel on the opposite side of the failed sensor. That could cause the vehicle to pull to one side unexpectedly, increasing the risk of a crash, the automaker said. 
GM said it is not aware of any crashes related to the issue, but found 150 field claims alleging the condition caused unintended braking or lateral vehicle motion. A GM dealer in May submitted a warranty report relating to the issue of a 2018 GMC Yukon, and two days later, a GMC brand quality manager submitted the report to GM's Speak Up for Safety program that tracks potential safety issues, which prompted a GM investigation and testing. And still on the recall front, Ford Motor Company issued three safety recalls October 29th in North America, including 319,000 Ford Transit vans to replace crack-prone driveshaft couplings that were the subject of a 2017 recall. Ford said it's not aware of any accidents or injuries related to the problem, but that flexible couplings installed under the June 2017 recall can crack, creating vibrations that can cause the driveshaft to separate with continued driving. That can result in a loss of power or unintended vehicle movement while in park as well as damage to the adjacent brake and fuel lines, Ford said. The automaker said it plans to swap the flexible couplings for a mechanical U-joints, but until the ne necessary repair parts are available, it's telling dealers to install a new coupling every 40,000 miles. The recall covers over 293,000 transits in the U.S., almost 23,000 in Canada, and 2,744 in Mexico from the 2015 to 2017 model years. Well, that's it for this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and as always, may the wind be at your back as you cruise down life's highways.